Well, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, as the case may be. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, the topic which I've been asked to address is this complex relationship between citizenship and nationhood. But I will also talk about universalism, the idea that maybe there is some kind of a, a single humanity that shares uh, political, economic, uh, cultural traits that make it unified or united. Now, let me begin uh, with the past, and I'm going to focus on Europe, not least because the particular idea of citizenship uh, that uh, we have, more or less everywhere in the world, has European roots. I'm not saying this is good, I'm not saying this is bad, but I think this is a historical reality. And basically what citizenship today says is that there is a two-way relationship between the ruler and the ruled, government and citizens, a reciprocity of rights. Now, if you think about it, this is a little odd. If you look at various different parts of the world, uh, historically, then the idea that um, the emperor or the highest ruler owed very much to his, I suppose occasionally her subject, was completely ridiculous. So where does this strange European idea come from that rulers ruled are linked in a reciprocal relationship in which, of course, there will always be asymmetries of power, they will not be equal, but still they are linked and secondly that each side owes something to the other. Well, I see this as having two conjoined uh, interlinked origins. In the first place there's the Christian doctrine of everyone is equal in the sight of God. Now if it's everyone then that clearly means the king the emperor or your local overlord. Difficult to enforce, but not impossible. Um, I'm not good with dates, but I think this is at the end of the 11th century when the Holy Roman Emperor, who I think was the preeminent Christian ruler in, in Europe, had a quarrel with the Pope, the papacy. And the papacy put the Holy Roman Empire under interdict, which meant there are no religious services, Roman Catholic services at the time. That's to say no funerals, no weddings, no christenings. And this is profoundly disturbing, the idea of leaving the dead, burying the dead, but not actually in hallowed ground. So if you are a sincere believer, you do not know whether that soul will end up in purgatory, in hell or what. And it, it, there were three years of rising dissatisfaction until the emperor was forced to go to the Pope and say, sorry, um, your sorry, Holy Father, I take it all back and there was a deal and the interdict was removed. Now, again, if you take this and try to see it in the context of the Chinese emperor, possibly there some of the mandarins, some of the censors would go to the emperor and say, um, celestial emperor, maybe what you're doing here is not the best. It's almost inconceivable in Russia and I don't know enough about the pre-Columbian empires in America. But what is very clear is that there's this two-way relationship from a very early, uh, early on, effectively from when uh, the, the, whole, the Roman Empire adopted Christianity as its religion. Let me stress here, we're not talking about democracy. We're talking about something else. We're talking about reciprocity of rights. Even if the rights couldn't be enforced, it was still recognized. The second pillar of this, well, uh, if you know European history, you will know that many European historians speak very badly of feudalism. And again, I'm not saying that feudalism, feudalism was the most wonderful system in the world, but it did a number of things. 
It created a vertical relationship between the ruler and all the ruled. In other words, the lowest peasant was in this vertical relationship with the king through the various layers of feudal lords. Um, and in that system, there, there were two way obligations. The peasant or the lower orders had to pay taxes and perform service for the feudal lords. The feudal lord had a certain obligation of protection. It may not have been discharged, it may have been neglected, but actually it was always there, it was always recognized. And the king, of course, had a duty to God. So you have an interlinked system, uh, which in a way becomes the foundation for what we see much later on uh, as the beginnings of a modern citizenship. Um, the second thing that feudalism does is that it demarcates a locality. You know who your feudal lord is. You know to which particular um, domain, or demain, I think is the correct term, you belong. Uh, it gives you a certain identity. It's not a national identity. It's not a civic identity. It gives you, however, a territorial identity. Now, this is very interesting because most people in the non-European world have non-territorial identities of family as a rule uh, or religion, as the case may be. In Europe, the identity by religion is, of course, there, at least until the Reformation. Um, and the great schism between Western Christianity and orthodoxy. But we can leave orthodoxy out of it for the moment. So what you actually have, and I think this is important, is that in Europe, it's not in any way odd or unusual for people to regard themselves as having a local identity. Local may be your parish, your village, your city, but it may be broader than that. It may be a, a duchy, it may be a kingdom, um, the kingdom of France established itself quite early on. And then it depends what kind of institutions the king, the ruler has um, to enforce that, to solidify their identity. And I'll give an example, England, and I mean England, not Scotland, at that time, not Wales, not Ireland, but England was conquered by the Normans, as or every British school child used to know, maybe still does, in 1066. What the kings of England do quite early on is set up a legal system that enforces the same legal system throughout the country, the courts of King Bench. And they have you have these traveling uh, the traveling judges. Um, and over time, this creates a uniform legal system, which then has consequences for identity, which there is other consequences when, uh, about a century later, I don't remember the date, King Richard the Lionheart is captured by the Austrians and held for ransom. The King's agents in England raise the ransom, so some huge some at that particular time. So what I'm suggesting to you is that the feudal system is working. People may not be very happy to contribute money to ransom the king, but ransom the king they did. Um, so what I'm saying here is that feudalism, um, let me stress again, it's not a democratic system, does have these consequences, which live on. Uh, they don't disappear. Think about the Renaissance cities in Italy, which have a very, very powerful local identity, the patria. If you read Machiavelli or Picciardini, one of the great Renaissance Italian writers, this shines through the attachment to locality and it's a kind of burning attachment. Um, something similar is happening in Flanders, South Germany, rather weaker, I think, in, in countryside areas. So these are the, the legacies of uh, feudalism. What uh, I want to move on to now is what happens in the 
16th, 17th, 15th, 16th century, the radical revolution of printing. Well, why printing? Because printing allows you to store information much more rap rapidly. It allows you to spread information much more rapidly. The functional result of which is that it's worthwhile learning to read. If you have a much larger literate population than what you had before, maybe one or two percent of the population, the state administration can use these literate people, create bureaucrats, um, and enlarge their own scope of activity because you have records. And the record keeping becomes central to the modern state, early modern state. Why is this so? Well, if you've got good records, you can tax people and you can conscript them and you worry about the people below the radar um, throughout Europe, 15, 20 percent of the population was somehow escaping um, the conspectus of the state, which meant, of course, they weren't being taxed. They might be caught. They might actually serve as mercenaries, but certainly they were outside the system and no system likes it. Uh, so by the late 17th century, 18th century, you have improvement in logistics, how to organize people, and you have improvement in policing. Quite interesting. And of course, people who are policed in the same way, over time acquire a shared identity. Um, indeed, I would go further and say, people have been run by the same state, retain some of that identity over time, even when they now belong to a new state, and even when their nationhood in the cultural sense may be different, but I'll leave that till later. So what I'm suggesting to you, and I'm jumping ahead in time, is that modern citizenship basically grew out of this reciprocal relationship. And in Western Europe, after 1945, what came into being was the modern welfare state, where the state really looked after the people. Cradle to grave, well, again, you had the same 15, 20 percent percent problem of people who, were, who managed somehow to be outside the purvey of the, the welfare state. But I think it's fair to say that something like 85, 90 percent of the population were inside the welfare state, profited from it, and the welfare state really did give you education and ensured that you didn't starve, uh, you had somewhere to live uh, through state housing and so on. I mean, in France, they talk about the glorious 30 years. Uh, in Britain, the, wealth, the social democratic welfare years. And let me add here that although much of that time, from 1945 and we'll say 1979, the Conservative Party was in power, they didn't touch the welfare state. They accepted that the welfare state was uh, an acceptable and satisf satisfactory way of running the country. Well, much of that has gone, but the National Health Service in Britain remains. And it's a kind of sacred icon, uh, the large sizable leftover of the welfare state. It's, uh, welfare state is expensive. Um, tax re revenue has to be extracted and so on and so forth. But it has something in its favor in sustaining a relatively egalitarian uh, system. Unfortunately, the system turned out to be unsustainable. Basically, I know I'm abbreviating the story, basically because citizens demanded more and more, which after the great oil shock of 1973, the states of Europe were simply not able to provide. Energy costs were rising. And what had not been clear was that the welfare state was founded on cheap energy from the Middle East, mostly. Venezuela, Nigeria. So if the price of energy went up, 
Then the cost of running industry went up. That was less to redistribute and so on and so forth. So with the demands from below of the 70s, again, Britain was the most acute. I have personal memories of the so-called winter of discontent when there were rolling strikes and um, there was rubbish everywhere. Hospitals were not functioning. Once again, as in the Middle Ages, the dead were left unburied. This was an intolerable crisis. The system was unsustainable. And basically, Thatcherism took off, which said, no, the state must get out of this business. Uh, stop the cradle to grave uh, provision. How far do you go? How much do you hand over to the market? We're still arguing. We've probably gone too far in the direction of the market. Um, especially as we now can see the effects of gl a globalized market, not just a statewide market, but a globalized market, which has all sorts of dynamic processes over which the individual, all the state of which is citizen, of which she is citizen, have very little power. So there are the unintended consequences of moving out of the welfare state of coping with the legitimation crisis of the late of the 1970s is this. We are now living in complex systems of higher levels of instability and unpredictability, um, helped also by the end of the Cold War, which loosened up structures in both throughout Europe, throughout the world. So um, what does citizenship mean? in this situation? And the answer is, well, it still means quite a lot, uh, but I'm not sure that it means as much as it did in the 1970s. If you believe in citizenship, you will see this as, if you like, retrograde, you will see this as backsliding, I don't like these terms. I just see a, a change, an alteration um, in the relationship, which is still a reciprocal relationship, between rulers and ruled. But citizenship, and I want to stress this, is limited to a particular state. And the state has boundaries. It's a bounded territory. It has a territory. Um, and there are people who don't like this, who are opposed to citizenship because it excludes. Well, it does exclude. Um, I'm a citizen of Hungary, so by definition, I, I'm excluded from being a citizen, let's say Japan. Not that this concerns me, but each and every country, there are I think 194 countries recognized by the United Nations, thereby excludes 193. So if a non-citizen comes to your country, he or she will have fewer rights. Not necessarily zero rights. If they settle down, the permission, permit to stay, the work permit, contribute taxes, they will acquire some rights. But it's citizens who have the full rights. Now, there are many people, the universalists, who don't like this, who in fact are very critical of citizenship. They are thinking in terms of a single global citizenship. I myself think this is pie in the sky. I simply can't see uh, the readiness of people to give up their state citizenship. Um, citizenship is disliked by egalitarians because it clearly creates inequalities. Um, a French or a German citizen evidently does much better in terms of quality of life than let's say, I don't know, a citizen of Mali, a, a poor African country. No question, it is unequal. So egalitarians uh, say, let's dismantle it and let's have a single global citizenship, which, as I say, I think is an illusion. Um, citizenship is also under attack from who, the people whom I'm going to call the reinterpreters of history. It's an interesting phenomenon of imposing the norms of the present, which keep shifting, onto the past. So currently, slavery and racism are acquiring the status of the greatest evil. 
And if anybody was in any way touched by slavery or racism, then they're excluded. I think actually excluded from citizenship, but we'll see. Uh, I think some of the activists, uh, racist, r racial equality activists, would certainly like to exclude those who do not share their views. This is a long way from democracy. It's a long way from certainly my definition of citizenship, which is the basis for a measure of uh, equality. Um, then, and I promised in my lecture title to talk about this, nations. Now this is tricky because the word has different meanings and these meanings often point in a different direction. In, Eng in American English and to some extent British English, nation, the word nation is now used to mean state. The American nation for me is the American state. The Hungarian nation is, the, is not the Hungarian state, but it could be. But the German state is very clearly the German state. Is it the German nation? We can talk about it. So what, is, what, what do I mean by nation? Well, nation for me includes a very powerful cultural dimension. It's a cultural collectivity with a sense of its past, which is continuously reinterpreted, and a sense of its future. If you don't have a sense of future, then a collectivity is going to give up. What's the point of being, of being a member of this collectivity? We don't have a belief in a collective future. Um, and then a nation constructs various instruments to ensure that it remains in being. The narratives of self, the symbols, the flags, and the boundary mechanisms like language, but it may be dietary code, it may be religion. Um, these are obviously profoundly in the way of universalism. The two are incompatible. So what the universalists are saying, nations are terrible because they are the hotbed, the ground base, the seedbed of war. Nations lead to war, nations are fascists. This is not actually true. Yes, nationalism can result in war, but there are countless cases where two nations, which don't necessarily uh, like each other because their historical traditions are varied or at, at odds, live peacefully side by side. Um, and if there are conflicts, if there is friction, there are instruments to resolve that. So I simply don't buy this historical inevitability that nationalism leads to war and leads to fascism. It's a wide, widespread view. Um, and indeed, it's coming into conflict with the anti-imperialist, anti-slavery, anti-racist, because I've seen a couple of books uh, quite recently, which praise Austria-Hungary unquestionably an empire for keeping down nations. If they were to say that about the British in India, I'm not so sure that they would get away with it. So uh, it's interesting how the different interpretations clash. What I would add here is that nationhood, as I've been defining it in its cultural sense, especially when it's tied in with political power, usually the political power of the state, is not going to go away. You need the state, or at least you need political power, to sustain your, your idea of being, your cultural reproduction. If you don't have that power, then some outside power can say, ah, we don't like you, we're going to stop permitting you to use your language in the educational system. There are cases as I'm sure you all know. So once you have this combination of cultural power and state power linked, the state nation, the nation state becomes very resilient. It doesn't go away. It doesn't, as I suggest, lead automatically, inevitably, so there's nothing inevitable in history, to conflict. There are conflict resolution mechanisms. 
So, um, my final point, and I've got about two minutes to make this point, is where does democracy tie in? Well, here we are in the midst of a conflict in definitions of democracy. Is democracy ruled by the consent of the governed, the old reciprocal rights that I've been talking about? Or is democracy a system ruled by values, which means that the consent of the governed is, well, it's not a necessary condition, it's a helpful condition. The jury's out, but there's a kind of conflict in the different definitions of democracy. Those who see nations, nationhood, as I've been describing it, as a either a necessary condition or certainly a very helpful condition of democracy, will say all this stuff about liberal values is unhelpful. The other side says the opposite, and I think we're seeing far-reaching conflicts uh, in Europe and also in the United States and no doubt elsewhere between consent and values. I, for my part, cannot see how you can call a system democratic. It does not include consent by the governed. It then becomes something else. Uh, an oligarchy, an empire, a protectorate, I don't really know. But let me end on this note. For me, democracy means input from the government through elections and other instruments um, and a system run on values uh, takes you away from the European tradition of democracy. So thank you for attention. I think I've used my half hour. It's a pleasure to talk to you.